WP. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Leonard Daly. The title of the presentation is PBR, A Standardized Approach. Thank you. It's that because it said so. Wild applause. <laughs> so the, sta the referencing that we did for physically based rendering back in 20, 2018 and 2020 are shown here. It's a little bit hard to see in the projections unless you look very carefully, but you'll notice that all the viewers were different. And this is not necessarily a problem with PBR, but a little bit of different understandings between the different developers of the viewers as to how exactly to implement these things. And these are primarily real-time 3D renders, but in, I think in one case it does include a ray tracing application. Shortly after that, in around the same time as 2020, Kronos started developing a certification program for rendering. This was a solution, but not necessarily the exact cause to, uh, to get everybody to get together. Mostly we believe it was due to increase the communication between the various developers uh, to reference that there was a problem and that it needed to be fixed and there needed to be more consistent rendering amongst the applications. So now GLTF has several different means and extensions for handling, uh, handling uh, PBR. There's transmission and alpha. Transmission is seen here in the glass where alpha represents the hole. There's anisotropy, clear coat, emissive strength. Uh, anisotropy is in the final stages of review and approval. Uh, you can see a couple of the examples in this one in particular in the GLTF sample assets repo. We do transmission and volume where the color of the light that's shown off from the model is dependent upon the thickness of the model, in this case, the drag, the glass dragon. Notice in some places like the tail that it's much lighter than the body. And that's not just due to the checkered background. There's transmission volume and index of refraction or IOR can be seen in this uh, glass dish with olives. It's especially apparent in the animation as the cover goes up and down, showing off the different and displacements of the olives. Iridescence shown on the inside of this table lamp. And then sheen and specular shown in the velvet cushioning of this, uh, it's called the glamour couch. And if you want to look at these things from a different, here's the text list of those. <clears throat> so the goals for today, are we're going to work on rendering consistency, work on new capabilities and features, model processing pipelines for scales, and making PBR easy for artists. The panelists we have today are focused more in the commerce and retail space, but we can take a variety of questions to handle this. The takeaways that you should walk away with when you leave the room is the state of the art, the current state of the art of PBR at Kronos, and the resources available from Kronos to either render, develop your own renderers or build models that will render correctly. Kronos also has a developer boff room, which is up in the VIP area on the second floor. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to see in the map, but it's a circle in green. We are in the circle in red up at the top. To get there, you take the escalators and you go to your left. If you see a sign that says v VIP and press only, one, you're in the right place, and two, you're VIP. You go, in, <laughs> you go into room 203. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other uh, sponsors for, this, for AWE in those rooms. Uh, so 203 is the Kronos room. These are the presentations in there. The two that are in bold listed for tomorrow at 1 and 1.30 are AWE, and they're in this room, Grand Ballroom D, and then down the hall at B. So we'll, those presentations will go into a lot of detail about GLTF. We may choose to defer some of the questions to one of those other sessions where we can answer, the, answer your questions more accurately and more completely than in here. So today we're going to have the presenters, Sandra Volker, Emmett Alish, Ash Miller, and myself, although I'm, this is my presentation, so I don't get to do too much. <clears throat> Sandra is a retail emerging technology automation consultant, engineer, and artist. Uh, she will be talking about PBR materials, tools for creation, efficiency, and quality. Actually, you guys can read this. Uh, also <laughs> presenting for Emmett as a staff software engineer working on open source tools such as Model Viewer at Google, 
Ash Miller is a 3D subject matter expert and generalist at Amazon. The way we're going to conduct the sessions today is each person making a presentation will have about five to seven minutes. Then we'll take a few questions from the floor. We'll move on to the next question, next presenter. You can ask questions during that time. Um, don't go back, but if you have something that crosses over the last, the last couple of presenters, that's great. And there's also be time at the end for questions to cover any topic that we cover today. So, okay. moving so, on to our featured presentations. All right. Hi, this works? Yep, okay. So we'll switch to the other laptop, please. And at some point, I'm going to be showing you some live 3D models, so I'm going to need my mouse and the keyboard, so I might have to put the mic down. But I can talk loud enough you can hear me, right? Yeah. All right. Woo! Theater voice. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I am Sandra Volker. I'm part technical artist, part 3D automation engineer, consultant, kind of a jack of all trades. Um, and it's been really exciting working in today because 3D is everywhere. And lately, I've been getting contacted by retail companies looking to expand those 3D models that they have and those 3D capabilities into even more spaces. So what do I mean? 3D is everywhere. So let's start, let's say we're lucky to have an initial model, uh, a design that was developed using a 3D CAD system. That's great, but now that model needs to be rendered and communicated to designers. The model also needs to inform 3D packaging. That model also needs to work with warehousing and shipping. How many fits in a container? How many can we store on the shelf? What kind of space requirements do we need? Then, of course, there's presentation. You have visual merchandising. You've got store design. And maybe that's in VR. Maybe it's in some other application. And then don't forget all the needs of marketing and the dot-com world, getting those products into customers' hands. So all those different areas can really benefit from 3D models, but how do we get all those 3D models to look consistent within all those applications and all those areas? I mean, if we're talking about building virtual worlds here, we want to bring our things with us, right? We want our stuff. we got to populate this world with stuff, and that starts with the stuff that we're developing in retail. So PBR and GLTF have been a big part of this solution and helping with the expansion. So let's go, let's start looking at other stuff here. <laughs> if you think PBR is new, it's not. The physically based rendering paradigm has been around since 2010 and it's been gradually creeping into 3D applications ever since, but when the Kronos Group picked up that format as part of their open source GLTF standard, that's when it really started taking off. Now you can find PBR material support in almost every major DCC application. Now here are the ones that I work with regularly, but this is not a complete list. Please don't think so, there's more. But that does raise a question, and that question is, what if I want to leverage the portability of the PBR uh, world and PBR assets so that I can give them that longer life cycle. But what if, yeah, sorry, I skipped something. <laughs> but yeah, what if you want to leverage the portability of the PBR standard, but your favorite application doesn't support it yet? What if you have a large asset library that you want to take to new places? You want to expand into these new areas? Because of the power of open source standards and innovation, there are plugins, tools, extensions, lots of resources that you can use to move those assets into those locations and work with PBR. Some of them are fully automatable as well. This way, you can build a hands-off process that works for your systems. And automation is a big part of the 3D creation pipeline. When you're working with large enterprise corporations and you want to push these assets through, automation can be such a helper. Unleashing what you may already have in new ways that can benefit your business. For example, validation to ensure asset quality, transcoding, moving assets between different formats, rendering uh, and for visibility so that we can have those different images go to different places, and creating variations and other creative tools that I can allow your artists to be creative and getting them away from all the technical mumbo jumbo. 
And when I mean that assets will work because we're using automation to help them work, I mean they're not just working, they're working in real time. They're working in ways that can instantly communicate and make someone excited, make someone um, understand and, and interact with these assets. With PBR materials and GLTF models, real time does not have to mean real sacrifice. It does not have to mean hours of rendering and large assets. Oop, I'll just do it this way. So let's look at some of these assets in real time here. Can I, ooh, I can do this, yes. Um, so this is a, using a couple of the new features. If you notice, I have some of the, I'm trying to keep these assets to have a small footprint. You're seeing them live here. Um, what is this, only 46 kilobytes. So we have anisotropic effect happening with our cell phone case here and also clear coat happening on top. Here's the, the actual 3D file, an example you saw some snapshots before earlier. But now you can see how the thickness of the glass distorts what's underneath it. We've got volume, we've got IOR going on here, we have transmission. And even when the lighting is just right, you can see a little iridescence happening, there we go, in the glass. So here playing with that iridescence a little bit more, here's a, a, a dress I made. And this was an example of practice what you preach. So I'm often writing automation tools in different applications that all support PBR, that's fine. But with this asset, I wanted to actually try it out. So the top of this shirt is actually developed using substance. The middle waistband, this sort of velvet sheen effect, another new extension, was used in, uh, created in Blender. While the bottom here, this sort of just simple iridescent skirt, was used creating a native GLTF tool called Gestalter. I think that's pronounced that right. Gestalter? Gestalter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks. So if you notice the effect, the lighting gets kind of a little more green or more pink, depending on which angle it's being viewed in. That's that iridescent effect. Here's a 3D version of another model you might have seen earlier. Only this one does not use any fancy effects. This is just your standard color, normal, metallic, roughness, and occlusion maps. That's it. But it really kind of shows how you can get all these different effects and in the hands of an artist, they can create amazing things even without uh, the availability of the new extensions. I'd say probably a good 80% of models can do just this. As Kronos starts expanding their different extensions and different um, capabilities of PBR, we kind of can start reaching more and more into those edge cases, into those areas that have those special types of materials. The more realistic and believability that an asset has, the more confidence that the users have in that asset. So for product design, that confidence brings better design without actually having to have physical samples, which helps with sustainability efforts. For e-commerce, that confidence brings a higher purchase ratio with lower return rates, again, helping sustainability efforts. Sustainability is a large part of why I do what I do. Also in gaming, Reality brings quicker, quicker acceptance. You know what that thing is, you'll get how to use it quicker and you'll be engaged with it longer. Also helping for happy customers and a bottom line. So, here's your homework. <laughs> no, if you uh, download this slide after the fact, I have some links here where you can click on and get some of uh, what my opinion are some of the most comprehensive but artistic friendly, not super technical, although some of it does get pretty technical, onto what PBR actually is, how it does the math, how to use it, how to use it within specific applications. And when I talked about automation and all those tools that help you, here are some of them and their guides. So yeah, that's the idea. Emmett, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. I should note that all these slides, the ones I presented and the ones that Sandra and others will be presenting will be on the Kronos website. Uh, we'll get the under, go under events and look for the AWE. They'll have the full list links to those, including the interactive demos that were given. Any audience questions? I did that so, well. Yes. No. <laughs> we have a mic here. and The reason for the mic is we're recording. So it's important to use the mic when asking questions. Hello. 
Uh, thanks. Uh, you listed the, the number of draw calls uh, per, yeah. per model. Uh -huh. Can you tell a bit about what determines uh, the call? amount of draw calls? Yeah. It, yeah, you know what, I could, but this the guy is the master, so let me hand the mic over. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be speaking next, but having written a bunch of the rendering code, I can get into this a little bit. But basically, draw calls are more or less separate materials. When you have a separate texture file that represents sort of what you're going to be looking at, that kind of thing. Um, and something important to keep in mind is that you do want to keep your draw calls down, but you don't need to focus on it absolutely. Um, if you have a thousand draw calls, that's a big problem. If you have three, five draw calls, that's not an issue at all. There is some overhead associated with a draw call, but it's not that large. Um, so you want to think about the trade-offs of atlasing all of your textures together um, versus having a certain amount of uh, flexibility, especially when it comes to, say, modifying your materials as you go along. It's often useful to think about designing your object so that you can go along and say, oh, you know, I'm actually, I have a, a part where this, a version where this one is red and this part is yellow. Make that piece its own material, its own draw call, and then you can update that on the fly without messing up your other materials. So you, you really want to think of your draw calls kind of like an API for your model. Okay. I know in our world, the, more, the fewer draw calls, the more efficient. You try to keep it down, but you try to make sure that it's still flexible and all the other numbers balance, poly count, everything else. So anything else? Um, I feel like it was a okay. bit generic, but I just want to be sure that we're meeting everyone's needs. So moving on, thank you. All right, next up is Emmett Lalas. She's a staff software engineer at Google working on open projects and other internal items. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on uh, model viewer primarily. And really what I'm here for is to make things easy, right? Like Sandra has been talking about the really the hard part, the most important part, which is generating the models in the first place. You know, artists creating these things. But once you have the model, what do you do with it then? You want to display it to your user. Um, and if you're like most people, you probably don't want to have to learn vector algebra to do that. So I am the maintainer of a free open source uh, web component project called Model Viewer. And it's designed to make it so you can put your beautiful GLB on your website with a single line of HTML. Um, it's made to just make it as simple as possible. We have lots of nice defaults that are aimed towards e-commerce use cases and such um, to make this kind of easy. And that's, that's really what it's about is being able to build this into an actual design of your website, right? Because 3D shouldn't be some separate thing. It should be part of the user experience. Um, and of course, Model Viewer is just one of many ways to do this. Um, I want to mention uh, some major ones like 3Kit and Sketchfab, which are companies that specialize in this kind of thing, right? You can pay them and they can give you a lot more support. They can give you things like what Model Viewer can can provide in terms of just a user experience, but they can also provide hosting. They can help create and QA the models. They can help with a lot of other parts of how you really build this into your business. Um, and there's a lot more companies than just those. Um, this is an expanding space, and people are realizing that you know, help is needed. We're all learning here, right? Um, as part of Model Viewer, um, Model Viewer is actually built on 3JS, I think was mentioned earlier. It's a great open source project on the web. Um, and as part of that, I have helped to work on this convergence of renderers. And we have made enormous strides. And I just kind of want to show here, you know, we're comparing Model Viewer, which is effectively the, the 3JS renderer, um, Filament, Babylons, uh, these are more open source renderers, um, the, the, the GLTF sample viewer, of course, made by Kronos itself. We even have a couple of path trace renderers. And these path tracers are important because they're not real time. Right? They take their time to make a really physically accurate result, the kind of thing that we just can't do at frame rate on a mobile phone. But the beauty of the GLTF standard is that it isn't telling you how to render this right now on a rasterizer. This is actually a future-proof standard because we specify things physically with real physical parameters. And that means that our... our uh, our golden standard is not what's happening right now in the space of you know, what happens to be a decent solution 
on today's hardware and rasterizing. We aim more for the path traced results, where they're doing, they're really taking their time and doing a really accurate job. And then we push our rasterizers constantly to innovate, to approach that as well as we can. And that's gonna continue into the future. So the nice thing about having a GLTF asset is you know it's always getting better. And it's always approaching the physicality that you've actually built into it. Um, and in the meanwhile, all of these rasterizers are amazingly consistent, which is really helpful. Because you don't want to have to think about having to re-QA your model when you move it to a new site or a new uh, technology. And when we come back to e-commerce, the thing I like to remind people is, you know, we take the image carousel absolutely for granted, right? The image carousel is everywhere. That is just how we sell things on the web. But it's there because that's what we know how to do. It's not because that is the best user experience. And the real beauty of bringing 3D into the e-commerce space is you can make something that is more engaging than the image carousel. You can make something that is more user-driven, right? If I advance to the next image, what am I gonna see? What angle is it going to be? What, what thing is gonna be presented? It's totally arbitrary from one site to another. Here, the user can choose where they're going next, what they want to see next. Um, you can see all of these things in context. So, um, you know, this is like a simple example here, but I like to remind people that, especially when you're using something like Model Viewer, it's not about just the 3D model. It's also about all of the web content that you can put on top of this. The rest of these things are not part of the 3D model. In fact, we can just automatically calculate new dimensions for a new model as it comes in. Um, that's, that's easy on the web, right? And we can take these things away instead of having to scroll over to the image that has the dimensions and then scroll back to the nice photograph. You can just let the user choose what they want to see and they don't have to break context as they're doing that. You can do so much more than this. Um, you know, I just kind of, I want to remind people that 3D is not video, right? We've kind of been going through the e-commerce space. It's like, oh, I had a carousel of images. You know what's better than an image? A video. Okay, we'll slap a video in there. Cool, done, great. Um, so 3D, sure, I guess we just slap 3D into that carousel too. Yes, you can do that, it's fine, but you can do so much more. 3D is not a video, it is interactive. So that means you can build a whole experience around it. Um, so I encourage people to escape the rectangle, right? We think of images and videos as always being rectangles. And yes, 3D is rendered on a rectangle as well, but you can put that, you can put a background across it. You can actually merge that 3D into the rest of your web design, into the rest of your page. Um, you can build things that are reactive based on how the user is scrolling. You can build a story that, trans that moves their point of view and their perspective around the product. Um, you can build customization, right? We were talking about how you change material properties and such as you go. Um, you can look at variants, all these things. Um, you can bring out callouts and zoom in on particular areas as people click around. You can make so much more engaging experiences than just a passive jump to the next image kind of thing. Um, so I really encourage people, you know, we, we build Model Viewer to take advantage of all that's possible with web design. Um, and I really encourage people to, to think with an open mind about what that enables, because you could be really creative with how you show things to users. Any questions for Emmett? So I'd like to note that Emmett's presentation, everything you've been seeing here, is all written in HTML. And when you're seeing the 3D models displayed, it is using the model viewer. So this is an example of their use in a very integrated environment where the effect is not made to be apparent to the user. This is live. <laughs> <laughs> I have one oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Question for the model viewer. Uh, so currently, does that support um, custom shaders created using Blender rather than just um, you know texture-based materials? Sure, so in fact, we do not, and very intentionally. So Model Viewer supports just the GLTF format, um, GLBs, and GLBs do not support custom shaders. And here's the reason. What's really powerful about GLTF is the future-proofness, right? By defining your textures in physical units, it means that the shader experts, I like to think I'm one of them, but there's many who contribute, um, have the opportunity to go through and actually improve and make those shaders faster, make them more accurate, 
make all kinds of improvements that you never have to see, and you never have to change your 3D model to get those benefits. That is the true power of standardization, and that's really what sets GLTF apart from all the 3D formats that came before it. Because when you're packaging a, a, a shader in the format, you are stuck, and not only that, it brings tremendous security concerns, because packing executable code inside your format basically disallows it from a huge number of applications including Google's. Yeah, that, that kind of uh, follows the, uh, the second question. I know that it supports um, universal scene description. Does that support that animation, like interactivity as well? So on GLTF, there's current active work for converting back and forth between USD and GLTF. It's not that there's current support right now. GLTF does have animation. Um, and the Kronos Group is working on interactive definitions uh, to support all sorts of uh, person and computer and external event interactions with GLTF. Yeah, that's exactly right. And again, it depends on your application. Sometimes it's useful to have those interaction models built into the file format. Other times it's actually better to have that outside of the engine level where you can have more control over it. But it depends on what you're after. So we'll go into a lot, your uh, topics of USD animation and interactivity a lot more in the afternoon session that's 4.30 today in the Kronos Dev Room, uh, where that is pretty much specifically the topic of what's coming up next in GLTF. Are there any additional questions? Okay, next up is Ash Miller. She's a subject matter generalist and expert at Amazon. Uh, special, especially uh, focusing on e-commerce and what it takes to get 3D models into the retail shopping centers. Thanks, Leonard. Um, so I started uh, about a year and a half ago um, on a project where we wanted to have the customer on Amazon be able to ingest their 3D content in the same way that they can do with 2D and video, um, which as many of you may already know, um, just the, the vast complexity of 3D, how many different elements there are, how much higher the bar is for entry of understanding, all of those things make that much harder to do than just providing an upload button and saying, okay, check the file format, and if it's good, put it in. Um, and so uh, I want to go through some different user experiences based on who you might be in the room, and I'm going to kind of try to go through them quickly, and then if you happen to be one of those use cases um, or yet another use case that I didn't get to, um, then feel free to raise your hand and ask a question and let me know what I didn't cover that I can cover for you. Um, but these have been the most common things that I have seen. Um, this product actually launched in the United States uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so you, if you're in the United States and you're a vendor or seller center user, you can use this now. Um, and so we actually have 3D content coming in from anywhere in the United States and soon to be coming in from other places in the world as well. Um, some of the biggest problems that I see is that uh, by the time that somebody gets to uploading, um, they're no longer a 3D expert. They purchased 3D models from somewhere or their 3D department made it but said, hey, we don't have the time to upload it. And so now they're trying to upload something. It may or may not be to the GLTF standard. Um, they see online what our specifications are, which say it must fit the GLTF standard. It must be a GLB or GLTF file. Um, they don't really know what that means and they try to put their content in and it doesn't go through. Um, and unfortunately, the feedback that we have to give to them is, hey, this doesn't meet the GLTF standard. Well, for the vast majority of people, that doesn't mean anything to them. Or, hey, a note is missing from your GLTF file. Like, that, this, this is not something that your media uh, director can go fix, right? And so now they're having to go back to whoever created that content, and they're having to say, hey, Amazon says that, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, um, this file can't be ingested. And a lot of the time that's, you know, involves them either paying more money or having some other kind of deal with the company who created the content. So I'd say if you're out there 
you don't know how to create your own 3D content, but you'd like to, uh, make sure that when you find someone to create that content for you, that there's somebody who can speak to standards and who can speak to compliance. And you can ask those questions pretty easily. Those kinds of resources are available on the Kronos website. You can go and you can say, hey, are you familiar with the GLTF standard? And you can even ask them to run all the assets through the GLTF validator, um, which is also available on our site. Um, and you can ask them to send that back to you and send those reports back to you so that you know for sure that the content that you built was built correctly. And that's not to say that there aren't other correct ways to build 3D models. Um, there are a lot of studios out there that don't use this standard and it's completely valid. However, it's not going to transfer to companies who are working with the GLTF standard. And so that's kind of like an upfront question that you might want to ask along with pricing and timing and um, all of those other questions that you ask when you get into a relationship with a company. Um, additionally, if you are a content creator and you want to create things for e-commerce, uh, you as well may also want to go and look at what the scope and specifications of the targeted platforms for your consumer are. So if you've got a client that's coming to you saying, hey, we have an online business, we want 3D models for it, it might be the right first step for you to go look at what that platform is that they want to put it on, whether that's Wayfair or eBay, Etsy, any, num any number of even smaller sites, right? Say, what are the scope and specifications that I need to hit? Most likely it's going to be an open standard. And then just make sure that you understand and familiar yep familiarize yourself with what those are. And it's not even that you have to create in that standard, but you do need to do conversion to meet those standards before you deliver those assets. Otherwise, your customer is going to end up with something they can't use. Uh, I see a question. Are we, are we allowed to pause? Yeah. No? We could totally pause. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a question in the back. <laughs> this is in your wheelhouse a little bit, but I was going to talk about uh, procedurally generated uh, tech, uh, models, uh, sure. sorry, shaders. And I've always had a problem bringing procedurally generated shaders into like Unity, for instance, because they don't want to come because they're tied to the app they came from. Right. Um, I can answer yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, wait. When in the design phases of production, procedural, of course, is, is amazing for its flexibility. Um, but in the end, when it comes to ensuring portability and meeting that GLTF standard that she's talking about, once you've locked your designs, you bake it down. That's really kind of, yeah. So you always keep that source asset that is high resolution, fully flexible and everything, that's like the parent. And then you make the children that are meeting standards. Yes. Oh, hang on. Let's, let Ashley finish. Oh, yeah. oh no. He's, I think he's going to answer that question. Yeah. Just going to quickly say that this is the key difference between GLTF and, say, USD and some of these other formats is we'd say GLTF is not an authoring format. It's a delivery format. And that's really key to keep in mind is that GLTF is not about having everything that was what you would actually use when you want to go back and touch up your model. GLTF is what you bake down into to make it efficient for web delivery. And it's not the one that you want to keep as your master. Yeah. PSD versus JPEG, same idea. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know very few artists who actually author in uh, GLTF, even though uh, maybe they are involved with Kronos even. Um, but what you do is you run that conversion step and that allows you to make sure that you end up in the right format uh, so that you can deliver it and so that you can deliver it universally. Um, and if what you're doing is you're creating something in a specialized, um, some other, you know, you have your own pipeline, right? Um, and then you're converting it to GLTF and it doesn't look the same then that's kind of a question where you want to take a look into where that happened, why that happened. Um, we may have resources or you may be able to reach out to us and find those answers. Um, and then you can fix it so that you, that you are seeing the same output from you know, your original pipeline to the GLTF pipeline and that you're able to move forward with delivering those assets to this wide variety of primarily e-commerce, but hopefully other places as well um, that utilize the, the open standard. Automation helps with that. <laughs> Automation helps with that a lot. I can say that like we have converters in our pipeline. I think you can even 
I don't want to lie, but I think you can upload FBX to us as long as it's compliance way, way more steps, but you can, and we have, an, we have a converter that will make it yep. GLTF, um, because if you author in FBX, which many people do, then that's fine. Um, so I also wanted to talk about kind of on the other end, um, preparing for scale. Uh, if you are a company that wants to ingest outside content at the GLTF standard, um, there's a lot of things that you may not have thought of, uh, and I know this from personal experience over the last year and a half. Um, just because something is GLTF compliant does not mean it's gonna run through every single pipeline, and here's why. Um, for instance, our pipeline was designed for the authoring method that we were using, which was GLTF compliant. However, it had other artist specific and studio specific requirements. And so uh, we had developers build it. They took a look at the files. They said, okay, these are, these are what the file requirements are. And they built that automation. And they weren't necessarily 3D developers. They were just developers who were building an ingestion pipeline. Um, and so then when we started taking things that had um, Draco compression, things that supported multiple materials, multiple UV spaces, well, we didn't support that because we weren't personally using it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't fit the standard. And so we had to expand what our automation and the ingestion pipeline allows for in order to not block people from submitting completely compliant assets just because they were built differently from the way that ours are. So if you are looking to intake assets to your company, that's something to think about in your pipeline. Do you have studio specific things that maybe you forgot about because you've been using them for so long and because it's been so hard to share for so long that you've never really had to come up against it before? Um, could just be something to look into before you open up the floodgates to taking in content, yeah? Um, also checks for GLTF compliant just like really early on in the ingestion process. Like we won't even, we won't, we don't even take a file unless it can pass the GLTF validator because why take it in, hold it for a while, get someone's hopes up and then send it back to them sometime later and say it's not GLTF compliant. You can run the GLTF validator very quickly or you can go tell uh, the person who's submitting, hey, go run the GLTF validator. And so this is something you can do before you take in the asset, um, you can require the person who's submitting the asset to do this. Um, I would recommend doing it as early on as possible and that can just stop you from having a lot of back and forth that's painful and that just doesn't need to be there. Um, another thing that you can do to stop that painful back and forth is just to really, really specifically state what your specs are and to say, this is what we need in order for this to run through our pipeline. And if you have additional things on top of the GLTF spec, put those things there and just say, if you wanna put stuff on our website, here's what you gotta do. Um, and sometimes that might come with some educational materials. If you can provide those, that's great. If you wanna to link to Kronos sites with educational materials, that's great, that's why we have them. Um, but the more visible those expectations are before when someone starts to interact with you, the better. Are there any questions for Ash? So I do have a question here for the panel. And in the spirit of Ori's presentation this morning, the intro, and how many did see that? So he came out there as a uh, hologram and started the intro and then explain the whole thing was done by AI. So how does AI help or hinder the process of PBR work? For all. Start on this Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, definitely work with some ML teams uh, around Google that do some, doing various explorations on this. Um, so first off, I think, you know, we've all seen stable diffusion, et cetera, um, being able to hallucinate an image from a prompt. And obviously there's fantastic work going along to hallucinating 3D objects from a prompt, which is really exciting. Um, I think that's gonna be a fantastic space for things like games, where you wanna generate a bunch of background content. Um, that will be really amazing. For e-commerce, it's notably less useful <laughs> because it turns out that if you hallucinate a product, it's not terribly likely to be the product you're actually selling. <laughs> Um, so there, there is a time and a place for hallucination. Um, 
Generally, in e-commerce, it's not a good place. However, ML is absolutely used right now, um, and I'm sure it will be used more in streamlining this process. So um, a lot of what people are excited about is 3D scanning, right? Yeah. As much as, you know, what we really need right now is excellent artists to create these files, but there are so only so many excellent artists in the world, and there are a lot of products. So we want to find a way to scale these things. We would love to be able to take a bunch of photos of something and get a great asset. There's a lot of excellent photogrammetry solutions we talk about for this. And I think, you know, Apple demonstrated with reality capture that you can do it pretty well in a, in a PBR style. Um, so that's, that's a pretty powerful thing. And I'm sure that they are using ML algorithms to help fill in those textures. But they're using a lot of input data to make sure that it's deeply grounded in reality. And I think that that's really helpful. And I think that we will see more of those solutions coming along that even if they're not producing a usable result, will produce a result that makes it much quicker for an artist to touch up and make ready for delivery. And that's the point that I get excited about when I'm working with artists and helping them to be more creative, more productive, faster. That's where AI can come in because that model that's generated with the sequence of photographs might not be ready to go straight to your website, but my gosh, it provides a lot of great information that can help a designer build around it, design around it, and maybe tweak on that shape to make a new design that they wouldn't have had quite as easy to do if they hadn't had that 3D shape in front of them. Not perfect for straight to the shop, but great for the brain, great for stimulation. I would say in the quality assurance process too for commerce because a big back and forth that we will have um, in general with any artist is whether or not this thing looks enough like the product to not then be returned when the real product shows up. Because at the end of the day, you can make a beautiful photorealistic 3D model, but if it doesn't look exactly like the product, you could end up with a customer return, right? It's useless. It's actually maybe misleading. Maybe you made it look nicer than the thing actually is. The person gets it now, they're very angry, they're gonna send it back. Um, so also looking for ways to use AI to improve those quality assurance checks Quality assurance is a huge bottleneck in our pipeline, and it's a huge bottleneck to being able to quickly um, publish content, not only content that you know was maybe created by us, but content that was created by you and sent to us. Um, and so I would say in that process, very helpful. Ooh, ooh, yeah, and that's an interesting idea. If you're working with a particular brand or a style of product, training an AI as to what that brand or the rules that kind of that brand or that style follows, mm -hmm. And then having that AI create ideations, um, hallucinations, general thoughts, but based on the training of the brand can really spark creative ideas as well. We could probably keep talking about that, it's but exciting. happy to have another question. <laughs> so um, I don't see anything at the moment. Oh, we have one here. Hi. Uh Imagine that there is a huge JLTF file, like 100 megabytes, and we don't want our users to wait like a minute to download it. Uh, any tips how we can deal like with this situation? <laughs> In that page of links, I've got uh, three different tools that I've used that basically work in that way. There's, there's a new tool from Kronos Group, I understand. There's the Kronos Compressor. Is it out or coming out? Uh, GLTF Compressor handles textures, reduces the size of textures. It is in beta right now, and it will be released into full production this week. There's fully automatable tools like uh, uh, Rapid Compact has one. Um, there's uh, LO, Insta LOD. There's Simply Gone. There's lots of processes out there, and more and more of them are 3D or uh, GLB enabled, PBR friendly, that kind of thing. Yeah, and just in case somebody's not quite familiar with all the terms that are being tossed, GLB is a binary GLTF. Yeah. Nothing really Same fancy thing. about it. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just talking to uh, somebody from the. Uh, I think of Ventana company. We, I believe their whole business model is exactly to help you with this, mm -hmm. this system. They've yeah. built tools. I'm sure there are others. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's, the main thing to keep in mind is just to think about all the different ways that you can optimize the model. There's a lot to it. It's not just one thing. And as much as we're doing our best to create pipelines to kind of automatically do it, the reality is you will do the best always if 
you have an artist actually involved, right? You don't really want to build your model completely independent of the idea that you want it to be efficient. Okay. I'd say one thing that is useful if you are just an artist as well who's looking to do that um, about GLTF is you can take a look um, similar to FBX at the different components of your file. I think there's a misconception that poly count is always going to be the culprit, and that's absolutely not true. Uh, it texture size, and I'd say normal map. Uh, in particular um, can be surprisingly large because of just how many different shapes, you know, if, if what you tried to do is reduce the amount of geometry because you were super hyper-focused on poly count and so you made a crazy normal map, you might actually have a bigger model now. Um, and it depends on what it is, of course, but you as an individual can troubleshoot that by looking at the different files within the GLTF folder. If you have a GLB, it's compressed, you can't do that. Um, but within the GLTF, you absolutely can, similar to FBX. And I would encourage you to take a look at your textures, too. And I would just add one more thing, which is lowest common denominator when you're trying to do portability. So if you have a particular tool or process that needs a really light model, if you can make that model really look good and keep those numbers low, now you can just move that model everywhere it needs to go. Um, now you can always rerun those compression tools to get something down and have it be stepped. But if that lowest common denominator can be flexible enough, that makes life easy. Okay. Next. Any another? Yes. We have another question here. Can we pass the mic around? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. I'd love to hear you guys um, comment on this pattern that I uh, recognize in other media types like music and. Uh, uh, yeah, audio in general, things end up in sampled forms, um, right? Ordered sampled forms, specifically. When we talk about GLTF and this like uh, JPEG or 3D, there's a bis disconnect there. It's not sampled form. These are vector type formats, like polygons are vectors. Um, so do you guys see uh, a way to do 3D in uh, ordered sampled form that's actually viable, you know? Uh, that would actually make more sense with this AI generative stuff that we see in 2D, like Midjourney and so on. They're not dealing with vectors; they're dealing with order sampled pixel, you know, JPEGs and so on. So, first off, I would actually say that GLTF is really a hybrid format, as are nearly all 3D formats. Right? The triangles are vector, the textures are pixel, and in fact, as my colleagues here were saying, the most important thing with figuring out how to make an efficient model is the trade-off between the vector storage and the pixel storage. They're both really important. And as a general rule, you tend to actually push more toward the pixel storage than the vector storage to get a good result. Um, and because of that, I think that, yes, a lot of these AI generative methods that are pixel-based will actually work very well, very naturally in 3D operating on those textures. But also, I think that you know the ML folks I know, at least, are uh, smart enough and flexible enough that I have little doubt they will be also hitting the vector side of things. Um, you know, the reason that the image generations are based on pixels is because that's what all the image formats are that uh, people care about. Um, in the space of 3D, we care about both vector and pixels, and I think that there's going to be plenty of work on both of those. We have, another, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah. we have another audience question here. Um, hi. hi. So I'm more familiar with the 3D formats such as uh, STEP, STL, OBJ. <laughs> um, you know, things you'd use for like 3D printing or 3D modeling um, in parametric software. Um, I'm wondering, does GLTF have any compatibility with those? Like, can you 3D print? A GLTF file? Funny, you should mention that. <laughs> um, my, my last career <laughs> before I got into 3D rendering was 3D printing. So it's near and dear to my heart as well. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned STEP and STL and OBJ. STL and OBJ are actually a lot like GLTF. Um, STL is terrible, don't get me started on that. But OBJ is actually very similar to, to, to GLTF. It's a bunch of triangles, basically. Um, the, what's really different is STEP. Right? When you look at CAD formats, you're talking about NURBs, you're talking about curves. 
um, which is kind of a different concept. And you, it takes a significant amount of work to convert those curve type formats into triangle formats. Um, but frankly, 3D printing doesn't deal with those very much either for the very same reason. Um, I think GLTF files should be perfectly printable. I don't know that anyone's doing it right now just because it hasn't been the focus, but I would actually really like to encourage it. And just as a total aside, I have a side project called Manifold that deals with computational geometry, deals with the kinds of uh, geometry issues that we need for 3D printing. Um, and I actually just developed an extension for GLTF to make sure that it's actually lossless for that kind of data. And I would love to see that adopted further in the 3D printing industry because I think it could make it a lot easier to go back and forth between the rendering world and the manufacturing world. So for the same processes that you take OBJ to STL, should be able to do GLTF uh, with the exceptions that you're going to be dropping a lot of the texture information along the way. Some of these same tools we were talking about that do optimizations of GLBs will also switch formats of GLBs. Mm -hmm. Heck, you can load a GLB in Blender and save it out as an OBJ. You know, I think even an STL, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, I mean, a lot of these tools are interchangeable, so. So we're on the topic of CAD. When people design CAD models for something that they're going to build as a manufacturer, and this question is to Sandra, um, they get it, it's designed in CAD, it has basically no texturing, no coloring, no surface material attached to it, except there may be some textual descriptions describing that this should be wood laminar or this should be painted or whatever it is for the particular object. How does an artist go from the CAD model with minimal or no model surface information to a PBR model? Again, a lot of those same tools out there will help you with that process when it comes to converting the actual geometry. Now, if a CAD model doesn't have materials and you want to be using PBR materials, that's when a material library becomes really important to have. Whether you have that as part of your studio or as part of the manufacturer, if I'm going to make something in this semi-transparent plastic, and I know it's plastic, the person who's making this plastic cup might just have that plastic PBR material. And that's where that portability and um, common language comes in, because you can have studios and, and manufacturing houses all around the world that can build that same sort of PBR asset material library that can go on models all over the place. So what I mean by that is you take your STL in, you bring it into an application that supports uh, starting to material that, you bring your materials in that are PBR enabled, your artist has a nice time creating those surfaces and then ports them out. Yeah, I would just add that if you, it, a, a lot of the time what we'll see now is that folks who have CAD models, they're actually using those to create their product images. Um, we could do this with GLTF too, by the way. You can render out instead of having something photographed, which especially for large objects is a huge, um, not just saver of money, but improving the uh, environmental impact uh, before people were shipping couches to us to be photographed and we weren't shipping them back because the cost of shipping was more than the cost of the couch, right? So there's like all of these kinds of benefits, but um, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that, but just to say that they had been um, rendering out their product images using these CAD files with PBR materials and so they would already have them. Um, one warning if you've got a CAD file, you're going to convert to GLTF. Um, and then you want to run it on a web application, just make sure that you're cleaning up anything that's not going to get utilized. I receive things that are converted from CAD all the time that still have all the interior parts, and you can't interact with any of those. So you have a million polygon model, and it's real simple, and you're like, where are all the polygons? You open it up, they're all on the inside. So just remember like, what you're using it for, and be conscientious. <laughs> And, and some of these conversion tools have what we call the hollow out feature, which is get rid of everything that's inside because you're not going to need that. <laughs> so they exist. So we are essentially at the end, but we have time for one very short question if anybody has one. And if not, I would like to thank you for attending the panel and our panelists, Ash, uh, Sandra, and Emmett today. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>